Welcome. Uh, my name is Mark Little. I am the immediate past president of the Geological Society of America, and I am very excited uh, today to have two wonderful folks to talk with about um, the Geological Society of India and possible areas of collaboration between our two societies. Um, I have with me Dr. Harsh Kumar Gupta, who's the president of the Geological Society of India. He's an earth scientist and seismologist and especially known for pioneering work on estimation of reservoir-induced earthquakes. Um, he's a former vice chancellor of university in India, um, has been awarded many uh, national scientific and civilian awards in India, um, and he'll tell you a little bit more about um, his background, but we're very excited uh, to have him with us today. And we also have Dr. Abhijit Mukherjee, who's professor of geology and geophysics physics at the Indian Institute of Technology in Karagpur, West Bengal, India. Abhijit is in a special position because he is a member of the Geological Society of India and the Geological Society of America, and also uh, is on council uh, with me and others uh, at the Geological Society of America, and has been really instrumental in this new partnership uh, between the two societies. So we have a lot of interesting things to talk about, um, Harsh, but first I was wondering if you could just tell us a little bit about why you're a geoscientist, what are you um, particularly interested in, and uh, may, a little bit about the Geological Society of India as well. Okay, I think uh, first question first, uh, I'm a geophysicist, and it so happened that uh, after doing my intermediate, then you choose what line you will take, and my elder brother was uh, working for the Oil and Natural Gas Commission. And there he discovered that there is a dearth of geophysicists in India. And a uh, lot of physicists were becoming geophysicists. So he advised me to go for geophysics. I had no idea what geophysics is. Now, there's one Indian school of mines in uh, India located in Dhanbad. It is on the same lines as the Royal School of Mines and the Colorado School of Mines in USA, set up by the same person. David mm -hmm. Penman. So I entered for the entrance examination with uh, geophysics as my choice, and I was fortunate to get selected. And then, of course, there was a four-year program, uh, which I went through and did reasonably well. And my first posting was uh, at uh, Central Seismological Observatory in Shillong. And Shillong is a beautiful place in Northeast India region. And uh, the first task that I had was to assist the team of US Geological Survey people to set up the worldwide standard seismograph network. And I loved it and I got glued. And imagine working in the world and with no experience about earthquakes and suddenly you, in those days, you would have those huge uh, clocks with pendulum for timekeeping. You know, there were no digital clocks and the way they start uh, rumbling and all that. So experiencing earthquakes sitting in a vault and Shillong in a, is in a pretty seismically active region. So I got started with that. And then we had the great Alaskan earthquake of 28th March, 1964. And uh, that earthquake, uh, you know, those days we had uh, only the paper recordings. And it generated a uh, rally and uh, love waves, which went round the earth several times, 17 or 18 times. So to decipher them, then when, how do you follow the trace? So I got totally glued to seismology and uh, then there's no looking back. And then later also in my life, uh, many uh, incidences came, uh, which brought me much closer to the earth. And uh, I, from a very childhood, uh, I grew on mountains. I, 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 my childhood was on mountains in Missouri. So I'm fond of nature, fond of walking and fond of uh, looking at things. So it, I just gelled into it. And uh, after Shillong, uh, I then came to the National Geophysical Research Institute because uh, at that time, they wanted to set up a station similar to WWSSN in Hyderabad. 
And by that time, all the commitments of the US Geological Survey were over. So they couldn't uh, provide an additional station to India. They had already provided five, including one in Shillong. So the director of uh, National Geophysical Research Institute, he wanted someone to set it up. So he hired me and uh, I got all the equipment and put it together and it's functioning. And the interesting part is that uh, that station in Hyderabad is was scheduled to start early in April, March or April of 1968 because the director had taken somebody to come and inaugurate it. And on 10th of December, 1967, we had the coin earthquake. And I got very excited and I took permission to start that station. So the station in Hyderabad they started to, 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 to record the coin aftershocks. And it hasn't stopped since then. And then soon after that, we went for a field visit to the Koina region and such interesting things were seen there. So that is how I got totally glued to seismology. And I think I was also lucky because uh, using uh, surface waves, uh, I looked at the surface wave which had gone below Himalaya, Himalaya and Tibet plateau region and the surface wave generated by earthquake in the Arctic, which had not gone through this Himalayan mountain region. Uh, say, for example, in, uh, in, in Singapore or on the, uh, on, in Tehran, et cetera, et cetera. And you would see, really see the difference in their behavior. And if you subtracted the equivalent path, you could isolate the portion of the Raleigh and Love waves in the Himalayan region only. And that, when I interpreted, reverted it, then I found that the thickness is 65 to 70 kilometer. And when I said it so, no one would believe me. I said, but what, what can I do? This is what uh, the result I'm getting. And uh, I think I was brave enough to send it for publication to the bulletin, Sassanologic Society of America. And after some questions, they published it. And it is now a well-known fact that uh, through a lot of uh, deep seismic sounding and other studies, it is found to be true. So our work on triggered earthquakes continued and some many interesting things happened. And finally, I had uh, quite a bit of training in Japan. I had worked with Kyo Mogi. Kyo Mogi is a person who has uh, created earthquakes in the laboratory under different geological situations. That was a very micro earthquakes. And then he compared them what was happening in the field. And he categorized earthquakes into three categories, type one, two, and three. And they were typically occurring Type 1 would occur in a region which is very homogeneous and stresses are uniformly applied. And such earthquakes would not have any foreshocks. The main shock, aftershocks, die down very fast. Type 2 work when you introduce some heterogeneity in the media, then you will have a lot of foreshocks, main shock, aftershocks continue for a long time. And when you introduce a lot of heterogeneity, then you don't have a main shock, aftershock. You have a swarm of earthquakes. So this was all laboratory. Then he showed the field experiments field observations, which fell into these three categories. So this was in the back of mind. So when I started looking at the coin earthquakes, using in those uh, paper records and digitizing them, I could see that coin earthquake was not a one event. It was a multiple event. And uh, we got seismograms from all over the world. And you see different azimuth would have different uh, orientations. So I could trace first, second, third, fourth events and plot them and see that that was happening. Then we, that was the same time we realized that Koina fell in type two of Mogi's model, whereas the normal earthquakes in Shield region, Deccan Volcanic Province, they belong to type one. So when we looked at earthquakes at uh, Boulder in USA, at hundreds of places, I found the same thing happening. So that's where we created this criteria for classifying reservoir trigger earthquakes, which fell in this one category, and that differentiated them from normal earthquakes, which would be, and then this criteria was later on used because there was a time uh, mark uh, in 60s where no one would believe that there's anything like triggered earthquakes because engineers would not believe it. They didn't want to accept it. And then I had to convince them that you have helped us because if the coin earthquake had not occurred in 1967, a bigger earthquake would occur after some time. We don't know when, and the damage would be much more. Anyway, 
So now these criteria are globally accepted. And then of course I kept working on many things. Uh, uh, somewhere I think I was lucky also, I was uh, made in charge of the uh, Global Seismic Hazard Assessment Program, GSHOP. Uh, this was in 1992, 1992 to 1999, some 500 seismologists worked all over the world, globe, to come up with the first global seismic hazard map. So this map provides you the anticipated accelerations at the basement. And then you can see how this will be amplified by the surface and uh, you can do all lots of things. So I've been on uh, this kind of work and then later in my life, we were able to make uh, medium term forecasts of earthquakes and in Koina short term forecasts. But uh, what I'm realizing more that even if I tell that a magnitude seven earthquake would occur tomorrow at 12 noon in Delhi, can everyone leave that place? No. So you have to learn to live with earthquakes. And that has been the focus of my work now, how to generate earthquake resilient societies. And we have done extensive work in this direction by creating earthquake scenarios. For example, if the 1905 Kangra earthquake, which claimed some 20,000 lives then, occurs today, we could leave, we could lose up to 0.9 million human lives. So I was uh, very worried when we got these results because what we did, we generated the isosasmals. On those isosasmals, we kept the typology of the houses. So you get to know how many houses would get destroyed. And then you put the layer of population density and you get to know what kind of damage would it do, how many people will die. So it was a little surprising, but then you see, in 2005, we had the Muzaffarabad earthquake, only magnitude 7.6. It occurred at nine o'clock in the morning and 87,000 people died. So from 7.6 to eight, the energy released by earthquake is at least 10 times more because it's a logarithmic scale. When you go from magnitude six, 6 to 7, the energy release is 31 times more. So a 7.6 earthquake claims 87,000 lives when it occurs at 9 o'clock in the morning when everyone is out. Because in India and many developing countries, the people get killed because of the houses that they're living in. And uh, if a 8 magnitude earthquake occurs, occurs in the middle of the night, uh, I think it is not a long number. So that is what is happening. Now, talking a little bit about the Geological Society of India, uh, it was created in 1958, on 28th of May, 1958. And uh, we had very, very, very well, very prominent uh, earlier presidents of the Geological Society of India including persons like D.N. Wadia. D.N. Wadia is the one who wrote a book on the geology of India, a very prominent person that we had Dr. P.P. Radhakrishna for a very long time, he, and of course, many other uh, stalwarts. And the idea was to provide a forum for the Indian earth scientists to put their results at a, in, in, in a journal. So the Journal of Geological Society of India started in 1959. It is started being once every year, then two every year, then quarterly. And from 1969, 77 onwards, it has become a monthly. It is published every month. In 2009, we had a co-publication uh, agreement with Springer, which uh, has continued till now. It will finish by end of this year. But now we are switching over to geoscience world and Geoscience World will be collaborating with us to publish it. So that has been a very successful uh, thing and it has given us a lot of visibility. Then Geological Society of India also publishes memoirs. It publishes uh, books for the children. Uh, we have <clears throat> a book on geology of India by Ramakrishna and Vedanathan, which has gone to four or five editions. And there is also a lot of focus on popularizing science. And we have got books on the geology of all the states of the country. Then we have a lot of books in different languages of India because uh, it is necessary that people are able to read it in their own language. 
So this is all going on. Then there are also a lot of publication of field guides. You know, field visits, how do you do, what you do. And then also we have such programs like monthly lectures where we call very eminent people and every month uh, somebody will give a lecture. And uh, this pandemic uh, opened up the gates for online lecturing, which was not very popular earlier. So we were, uh, earlier we would uh, have a situation that a person will come to Bangalore to give a lecture. But now the lectures are given from people all over the world. I was people from USA, I think we have half a dozen people who honored uh, our request and they gave lectures. So that is a very popular thing. Then uh, we have also done several things internationally. For example, we published episodes. You know, that is a journal brought out by the USGS, not USGS, IUGS, International Union of Geological Sciences. So for seven years, we published this from 2009 to 2016. And then we held uh, some important international meetings, just like the 10th International Kimberlite Conference that was hosted by us in Bangalore, where people from almost 40 countries came. And another activity which I find uh, extremely useful is this International Earth Science Olympiad. The one Olympiad uh, was just concluded and uh, we had uh, around 3,500 high school students who appeared to be selected. Out of them, we selected 30. And these 30 students were put through a very rigorous training of uh, 30 days. And then we had to select eight of them. And these students had, had no knowledge of geology because geology is not taught as a subject in India and in many other countries. So after that, uh, they participated, eight of these people. And I'm very proud to tell that all of them once either a silver or a bronze or a gold medal, which is very, very appreciated because there are almost 80 countries participating in this uh, Olympiad. We had also hosted this Olympiad in 2013 at Mysore, and we had people from almost 60 countries who came and participated in it. So all these things are going on. And uh, I think uh, we are on a, on a, on a very good uh, ground and uh, we also hold national seminars on important topics. For example, this uh, November seminar on geodynamics of Himalayan disaster management in which uh, we are inviting people from Geological Society of America, they would be coming. And we have just uh, decided to have a special talk there on Chandrayaan. This gentleman who gave a talk yesterday has kindly agreed that he'll come and give a talk because I found his talk very interesting. So I think we are developing and we are growing. And I'm very hopeful that the collaboration that we are going to have with Geological Society of America will further strengthen us. There is another area of very great interest to me and I think Abhijit is here. He would uh, surely support that. You see, water is disappearing, is not available in many places. And we developed a very positive way of getting usable, portable water from the sea. And that is low temperature thermal desalination. So what you do that you bring the water from the sea you flush evaporate it, and then you bring colder water from down below the sea to condense that water. And then that water is potable water. So this principle is known for many years. But what we did, first we tested for a 500 liters a day plant in the laboratory and saw that it was working beautiful. Then we upgraded it to 100,000 liters a day plant, and we stored it in Kavarati. Kavarati is one of the islands in the Lakshadweep group of islands. And uh, we estimated, it was done in 2005, that if this plant runs for 10 years, then the cost of per liter of water, you will get about six liters of water per US dollar. 
that plant has operated from 2005 till now. And in the meantime, many more plants have been set up in other parts of Lakshadweep. And there have been two very distinct advantages of putting this. Lakshadweep has a population of only about 10,000 people. And they had no access to potable water. And this is the first time they got a potable water because everyone collects 10 liters of water every day, which is good enough for a person to survive. And uh, the cases reported in the hospital have dropped to less than one half. Because most persons went to the hospital for waterborne diseases. So that is one significant advantage. The second thing what happened that the water that we bring from down below and which is flash have operated, only a portion of it is retained. The rest is let out. And this water is full of nutrients. So when you let it out into sea, it becomes a very good fishing ground. So the fishermen are very happy with this program. Uh, what has not happened, uh, I was hoping that it will catch up globally. That has not happened. And uh, one main reason behind that is reverse osmosis. Because reverse osmosis has really gone so much in everywhere, in every place. That uh, anyway, this also has a very huge uh, application because there's a lot of industrial water, industrial waste water in fertilizer plants and a lot of manufacturing places where they are expected to release that water at ambient surface temperature. And uh, sometimes they have to cool it from 55, 60 degrees Celsius to 25, 30 degrees Celsius in Indian situations. So instead of doing that, you can use that 58, 60 degrees Celsius water, you can flash evaporate it and use the surface water, which is as 25, 26 degrees Celsius to condense that water and provide potable water. And this can be done on at any scale. Another very good application of this is, actually I had talked about it to British Petroleum and they were very keen to do it, but then they had the huge oil spill and British Petroleum became beyond petroleum and many things uh, changed. So you see on all the drilling rigs in the sea, they need fresh water. And they spend a lot of money in bringing that water from the shore. You can put small little ocean, uh, this uh, low temperature thermal resistant plants on each of the rigs, wherever on the platforms, and that will provide you fresh water instantaneously. So these are the things where we can do a lot of work. And uh, with your reach, I mean, we have done a lot of work on the entire Asian and Pacific countries. Uh, this was a responsibility which was given from ICSU which is now International Science Council. It was already International Council of Scientific Unions. So they created a group for the region, regional office for Asia and Pacific. And there we looked into three major things, earthquakes and uh, landslides and floods. You see, Asia accounts for almost 80% of human lives lost in earthquakes. And that situation can be changed. It should be changed. Similarly, all these island nations, small little island nations, the Pacific, there are thousands of them. And if we take proper care of them, the water rise at the sea level rise and many problems can be handled. So there are beautiful reports which have come after a lot of discussion by people from all over those islands and those countries, very knowledgeable people. But somehow, its real implementation is missing. As I think I've told Abhijit and I wrote to him also, we are now in the 23rd year of the 21st century. But in the first 22 years of the 21st century, you've lost more human lives in earthquakes and resulting tsunamis than the entire 20th century. This scene needs to be changed. And it is possible to change the scene if we work together, we tell people what to do. The techniques are available. You see, even a small country like Haiti in the Caribbean, they had an earthquake of magnitude 7, sometimes in 2010, killed 320,000 human people, claimed 320 human lives. They woke up and they did a lot of work 
So the earthquake which occurred in 2021 at the same place with a larger magnitude 7.3 the and about the same time life loss had dropped from 320,000 to less than 4,000. So a small country like Haiti and then I went through uh, what they did and how they did and it was very clear that uh, clearing or creating public awareness is the most important thing. So these are few areas in which uh, we can work together, we can go forward. And another thing which I very strongly recommend is introduction of geology along with physics, chemistry, biology in schools. So most of us join geology by chance, not by choice. Because as a high school student, I did not know what geology is. I had run, I had, I had learned a little bit of geography, but geology is a totally different game. So somehow we are trying to propagate that in India and in some places it has not come to the school level, but uh, post high school in at intermediate level in some uh, states like Karnataka where the headquarters of Geological Society of India is located, they have introduced a curriculum on geology in uh, intermediate classes. So these are the areas in which uh, we can work. And of course, uh, I'm very happy to welcome your participation in the forthcoming uh, conference at Dharamshala, which is going to take place in the month of November. And uh, we will have a chance to talk more. And the topic is of geodynamics of Himalaya and uh, disaster management, which is very important. A lot of uh, very eminent uh, scientists from USA, geologists from USA have done a lot of work in these areas. So we welcome that. Thank you so much, Harsh. I have, uh, I have a many, many follow-up questions, but I'll, I'll, I'll hold off on those for just a moment. I did want to just point out, I thought it was quite interesting when you were talking about your personal background, the connections with the uh, U.S. Geological Survey and Colorado School of Mines, I think were, were quite interesting. Both of those, um, in different ways, are organizations that GSA has close relationships with. Um, so it was, it was nice to see those connections there. Um, Abhijit, maybe if you want to just tell us a little bit about yourself and kind of how you see these two two organizations. Uh. Um, thanks, Mark. Um, so, you know, like my introduction to GSA um, happened when I moved from India as a student, as a graduate student, uh, back in 20, like two, 2001, which is almost like 23 years back. And uh, those days, my professor was serving in the organizing committee in the hydrogeology division. So I joined him as a st graduate student in hydrogeology. And he encouraged me to be a member of GSA. You know, I was barely a student and I didn't know about all these professional societies, but that first introduction to GSA kind of became my kind of a life changer. And since then, GSA has been my professional home. And uh, since 2005, I have, uh, for every GSA, including the time in the in the COVID times, I've organized topical sessions at GSA, uh, which is touted to be one of the most popular ones um, because it talked about water pollution and uh, you know uh, trace elements in in drinking water and so on. Um, so you know my experience with GSA has been really positive, and as you said uh, that uh, uh, in the last few years I've been serving in the council, in the, in the leadership, in the international committee. And uh, <clears throat> taking that role forward, what I thought is uh, when I decided to come back to India post my uh, graduation and working in the US for almost a decade, um, I thought, you know, like, you know, in India, there are a lot of very bright geology students, as well as geoscientists who are professionals working in both academia and industry. However, I could definitely see that there is a less outreach, less footprint uh, of these geology students or geoscience students and, and the professionals. So when I got this uh, invitation to, uh, to serve in the uh, leadership of GSA, one of the things I definitely thought about is that in some way, can GSA and GSI you know, can work together because GSA has this universal and global footprint and GSA is also one of the more older society who have been working uh, with a lot of members across the country, India being the most populous country at the present times. 
Um, and uh, just just uh, FYI, the Geological Survey of India, um, you know, it's one of the oldest geological survey in the world. If you yeah. if you know that, um, and it's just like a kilometer, well, a couple of kilometers from my home in Kolkata. So I have been going to the geological survey since my college days, my uh, you know my student days, and I was fascinated with the type of work that they have been doing for almost like last 150 years. So I thought it was a natural thing to bring the two societies together and introduce each other and try to make a bridge, so which I think personally think that would act as a kind of a trigger to um, to incentivize to grow the, both the societies in, in a global forum. And with you know the changing uh, geopolitics and uh, US and India now, you know, uh, diplomatically quite close to each other, I think it's it's the right time to have also the two societies to work together for the advancement of science and society. Well, thank you. Um, one of the also areas that you mentioned, Harsh, was that you got into the geosciences and geophysics by accident. And um, I, you're very correct. There's a few people who, you know, maybe are a child of a ge geologist, and so they they do it, but most of us, um, I had similar experience in uh, college where I was just looking through the classes and like, oh, these seem interesting. And and that's how I went down down this path. Um, here in, in the US, we've also been having conversation about how to increase the number of students who go to graduate school in geophysics, geochemistry, geology, and, and any of the earth sciences. We have a few a few high schools here and there that have a geology class, um, but typically there's a uh, maybe a, a, a chapter in a mm -hmm. science book, usually very yeah. early, um, about you know dinosaurs and um, and what else uh, hazards of, of some sort. And I'm wondering if you mentioned the Olympiad. I'm wondering what other types of um, activities uh, have you been thinking about to get more younger people aware of the geosciences? Because uh, I think that's another area where there could be some collaboration because we're facing the same same challenge here. But what we had done, we had uh, we had prepared a booklet, a story of the oceans, and that was when I was uh, the secretary department of ocean development to government of India. And that book was prepared by Geological Society of India. It's about a 50-page book uh, in bold letters, very simply telling all the concept about oceans. And then uh, we had uh, a few enthusiastic people, knowledgeable people trained as lecturers. And we, Geological Society of India supported them. And they went to, from school to school taking one hour time with these booklets, which was distributed free. And uh, that created so much of interest among the people, among the students. They got to know about the sea and they will have a number of questions which uh, come after they get to know a little bit about it, that what is it and how it is, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this kind of... Uh, approach where we can have uh, volunteers who would agree to go to the schools and schools would welcome them is again a very positive way because you see putting something in a curriculum is not easy because they're education boards you have to convince them yes. and they said that the students are already very much loaded but this approach if we are able to send some persons to these schools so some some students will get interested into it. Say, for example, for this uh, International Earth Science Olympiad, where I said that about 35, 3,500 students participated, we picked up 30 and finally eight. All of these 30 students had no exposure to geology and they were trained for a month's time by very good teachers. And several of them decided to take geology or as a as as a their future as a course that they will take, so we are planning to enlarge it further, make it more attractive. So instead of three thousand five hundred, 
if it can be multiplied by 10 times in the next three, four years' time. So larger people will get to know about geology, what geological sciences are. They're very fascinating. I think nothing is as fascinating as geological sciences. It, it catches up with your imagination. And today, Mark, the very existence of planet Earth depends upon how well we understand it and what we do for it. So a, a, a training early in your life that what is good for the Earth and what you should do and what you should not do is something which is very badly required now, very much required now. It's required globally. No, I, I agree. It, it seems strange for me sometimes when many of the things people are talking about, be it climate change, hazards, um, mining for resources for solar panels and the batteries that are required for renewable energy. This is all part of national global conversations in the newspaper and news every day. But then there's this big disconnect where yeah, yeah, yeah. people aren't aware that these are actual careers and there are people behind all of these things that, you know, there's training and you can um, have, you can have a career where you sit behind a desk. You can have a career where you're walking through mountains. You can have a career where you're under sea. You know, there's very different ways that you can kind of experience the, the professional life um, of a geoscientist. Um, but as you said, these are very necessary for the challenges that, that we have. Now with the lithium, it is now all the countries are trying to find where, where is lithium in their country. I'm like, it's such a mad rush for lithium. And we are not bothered about that. How will and what will we do with the, all these batteries when they are not useful anymore? How will we dispose them of? No one is thinking about it right now. We have not been able to find a way to dispose of nuclear waste till now. And the piles and piles of nuclear waste all over the world. Yeah. <laughs> um, another um, area that you mentioned was um, kind of the the potential for preparation around hazards and uh, yes, here the, a lot of the conversation and I think you know outside of the U.S. as well is about buildings, um, but it sounds like. One of the things that you are also talking about is um, kind of early warning systems and evacuations and um, how to get people out of harm's way as opposed to making, you know, always focusing on making, you know, buildings um, resistant. I'm, I'm, I'm quite, uh, actually, I'm very happy that we could do an exercise which lasted one full year. And this exercise was to create uh, public awareness and generate an earthquake resilient society in four states of India, uh, namely Punjab, Haryana, Himachal Pradesh, and Union Territory of Chandigarh. Because the 1905 counter earthquake was around this area. And uh, that time I was a member of the National Disaster Management Agency and uh, that is a ministerial position. So when you have that position, you are able to pick the phone and call the chief minister or the governor. And they all listen because they all mean well if they are properly told. So we started uh, this exercise by looking at the lifeline buildings. What are the lifeline buildings? All your hospitals, fire stations, uh, police stations. So if they are not, if these buildings are not capable of with understanding the anticipated accelerations due to the earthquakes. In, on, on, on 26th of January, 2001, we had the Bhuj earthquake, magnitude 7.8. The first thing which fell was all the, all the hospitals. So what do you do? And now there are techniques, there are rapid visual screening and many techniques which can tell whether a building at a place is capable of withstanding the anticipated decision, whether it's 0.3 G, 0.4 G, or whatever. So that is the beginning. Then after that, we always tell children that you go to a safe place when you get the first tremor of an earthquake. 
So what we try to tell during this one year of training that you cannot think of a safe place once you are in that area. So you should think ahead of time because all of us spend maybe seven to eight hours or 10 hours time in our school or the office or wherever we are. Then we spend around the same time at our home. And then we spend five, six hours here. Then, you know, we might be in malls or shopping and doing, playing or whatever. So you should think ahead of time that at all the places where we, where we are usually in a day, which are the safe places? So if I'm in the, the school, which is the safest place to go? If I'm in my apartment complex, if I'm on 20th floor, there's no way I can get down to ground floor. But if I'm on second floor, I can get down. So, so these are small little things which penetrate in the young minds very fast. And I've also realized that if the high school children are trained, they turn out to be a better citizen tomorrow. There were many incidences during this period where school children went home and insisted that their parents try to make sure that the house they are living will be able to withstand the kind of earthquake that could occur in that particular region. Another thing which I found very useful, which is disappearing, is some of the old practices. In Kashmir and that area, there is Dhaji Diwari structure. What is Dhaji Diwari structures? When they build a wall, they take a plank, a wooden plank from a tree, no more than one inch thick, long plank, and they paste it with the wall. And this was an ongoing practice for centuries. And those houses behave much better because there is something binding them together. So these practice needs to be revived. So at that time, we were able to convince the Kashmir government, the governor there, that, you know, you cannot cut a tree today that you should uh, plant trees only to be cut for dhaji diwari structures for the houses to be built in that area. So these small little things make a difference. And the most important thing is to make, uh, to observe an earthquake day. Uh, it's very interesting to see. In India, there's a book, Elementary Seismology by Charles F. Richter. He wrote in 1956. And he wrote about five earthquakes in India, which were damaging. It so happened that earthquakes have occurred at all those five years, five places which he had described in that book. And everywhere, the number of uh, deaths has multiplied with the increase in population. Say, for example, the 1819 Kutch earthquake killed some 300 people. And the uh, 2001 Bhuj earthquake in the same area killed 20,000 people because the population density is increased, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The only difference we found was for the 2015 Gorkha earthquake, which occurred in Nepal. Because in 1934, Bihar Nepal earthquake had killed again around 22 or 23,000 people. Whereas this earthquake on uh, 25th of April, 2005, 2015, killed only 8,000 people. When I discovered the reason behind that, that they have started observing 16 January as the earthquake day. And on that earthquake day, they train people. In Kathmandu, they have located about 100 safe places where people should rest in case they get some tremor. And one thing, an anthropogenic activity also helped them. Because what happened? They have drawn so much water from, from, from Kathmandu uh, Valley that the water table has gone down by about 30, 40 meters. So there was no soil liquefaction. Because in the 1934 earthquake, soil liquefaction was the main factor for destruction of the buildings. So if there is no, no water so deep, there will be no soil liquefaction. So sometimes a combination of this uh, really helped them out. So I've been pleading, and it's been now accepted that in India, depending upon the region, we should observe an earthquake day. So at least once in a year, people get to know what we should do, how we should do, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Similarly, I think this message can be taken to all the nations, to various uh, developing places through the support of uh, the two of us and uh, basically in the Pacific. Pacific Island, there are so many Pacific Islands and I was really horrified to see their conditions.
they all are sitting on 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 really a very difficult situation and this everyone realizes but uh, sometimes it is difficult to act on it that's not happening and that is what uh, we should keep on telling keep on telling convince the people convince the students if we can convince the young people then we have one half the battle one of the things that um, the geological society of america does on some of these kinds of policy issues is we develop kind of position we call position statements and so yeah. these are you know two three page document on something like geoscience education mm -hmm. um and we there's a whole process of creating these things but once they're done they're a tool for members of the of the society to use when they're talking with their um the local you know local elected officials or the school board as you mentioned it's very it's very similar here to get things changed <laughs> in the curriculum takes a very long time and it's, it's quite difficult. Um, but I'm wondering, um, or just maybe just saying that there, there could be some interesting ways of collaboration between uh, Geological Society of America and Geological Society of India uh, over communicating hazards, um, but also to your point, what are things that nations can do, whether it's observing earthquake day, um, whether it's identifying those buildings that are safe places yep. and making sure people, what's the safe place close to where you work? What's the safe place close to where you sleep? You know, knowing those kinds of things, um, I think uh, could be important. And then the other thing I keep thinking about is these are also the kinds of activities that will make more people aware of the geosciences generally and will connect to the education part too, because people see like, oh, there's this, Harsh has come to tell us about something. Oh, he's he. Why is he here? Oh, he knows about these things because he's a seismologist. What's a seismologist? And then it also is a way to increase the pipeline um, for the geosciences. I think uh, you have provided a very good lead uh, to a uh, action that can be taken to find uh, volunteers, find people who are interested in uh, spreading information in schools because uh, changing curriculum etc is not easy but most schools would not mind if uh, Harsh Gupta just goes there and tells them about earthquakes or someone goes there and tells them about what to do how to do when to do and uh, that way uh, indirectly you generate interest in geology in earth sciences because these are all our science related issues. I'm, I'm saying you imagine that uh, with the amount of rain we have in India, if we have proper rainwater harvesting, there should be no shortage of water anywhere in the country. All you need is to harvest the rainwater. And we are in the process of digging deeper and deeper and exploiting sometimes pelly water, which takes thousands of years to accumulate. So these are the things which uh, I'm saying we can we can make a plan to learn to live with Earth. How do we live with this Earth? Earth changes from place to place. How do we accept that plan of ourselves to be able to do that? Um, we just have a, a few more minutes left, but I I did want to take a, a step more just into the kinds of activities that GSI and GSA do, and there's a lot of overlap. And I think these are also maybe areas of collaboration. So we both have publications and uh, we're also part of geoscience world. So um, once once that transition happens um, for you, I think it'll be make it easier for our members to have access um, to each other's uh, publications. Um, we've talked also about what are ways that we can collaborate on on meetings and yeah. you know the, the meetings are far away from each other uh, generally um, but I think uh, with some with some planning there could be some interesting uh, ways of hearing more of the topics and the content that's at your meetings 
um, have our members understand and see that and, and vice versa. Um, and then another area that I, I think there's some potential as well is on this, on the student side. Um, yes. And I think that, um, and that's, I think an area that because students now are so familiar with doing a lot of things virtually, I think there's a lot of opportunity. What are the ways that we can get students in India and students in, in the United States and other places more connected earlier in their careers um, so that whether they travel somewhere for training or they want a research collaborator, those kinds of connections um, have been made early on. I think that's something that we can uh, facilitate. Yeah. Okay. Um, Incidentally, well, I'll be in uh, San Francisco for a meeting in the month of December. So in case anything interesting is there, I'm basically supposed to be there from 10 to 16th of December. And then uh, normally after that, I always go to Dallas where I spend many years. So we have still a lot of friends. So my plan would be to come to San Francisco and then from there go to Dallas for four or five days and then come back. But if there's anything which can be useful to the two societies, I'm very happy to attend to that during this visit to USA. Wonderful. Well, we will um, we'll have at least a couple of folks from GSA visiting um, at your annual meeting in Dar Dharamshala uh, very soon. And um, we'll definitely, I, I believe you're speaking about the, the AGU meeting probably in, in San Francisco. And, yeah, and it so, is the AGU meeting. And before that, there's a meeting of this Deep Time Digital Earth. Mm -hmm. Yep. And, I we'll, I, and I believe we'll be welcoming um, a vice president from Geological Society of India to attend our GSA Connects meeting in Pittsburgh. And so um, lots of opportunities to continue the conversation. Um, and maybe just to close this out, I wanted to, to ask you both um, if you've been following the Vikram Lander, I'm sure you have, uh, this wonderful global news. Um, it's news about the moon, but as we all know, the moon and the earth are, are very connected and just uh, would be curious to hear um, how you've been thinking about this and, and the impact that it could have on getting more young people interested in earth sciences. Abhijit, you want to talk first or you want me to go? Okay, I can talk for two minutes. So, you know, like um, it's a victory of science, you know, like that's the way I look at it. And uh, it is possibly one of the very rare science event that was live telecasted at least in Indian media, like all national media channels. So it was a victory of science. And uh, with it comes the geoscience, because just like you said, that uh, moon is just another extension of Earth. And uh, we are just trying to explore the moon and more specifically minerals and water on moon, you know, which brings us back to the geoscience. So as new data would be available from the Vikram Lander and the associated instruments, I think it will open up new gamut of uh, uh, avenues uh, in which we can do research on extraterrestrial geoscience, planetary geoscience, which I'm sure like would attract a lot of very young minds. Wonderful. I, I'll just say that uh, like Abhijit, we are all very excited about it. And it's a wonderful news. And there are some things which are uh, intriguing. The surface temperature on moon is 60, 65 degrees Celsius. Temperature at depth of 10 centimeters is minus 10 degrees Celsius. And this is after the sun shines for 14, 15 continuous days. So I'm not able to figure out that what kind of thermal conductivity the material has from surface to this 10 centimeter depth where the temperature difference of 70 degrees is being maintained. <laughs> so there are some very intriguing things coming out of it, but uh, it's very interesting. And I, I'm very excited that of course now the it has gone to sleep because there's no solar light, but when the solar light gets back and it gets activated again, it's going to roam around by another four, five, six meters. And it's, it's, it's a very, very exciting time. Actually, I told that yesterday we had uh, Prakash Chauhan, the director of the uh, 
National Remote Sensing Services uh, in Hyderabad, he gave a talk on uh, water on moon. And I mean, we are, we are hoping to invite him to our convention uh, in, 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 uh, in, in uh, Dharamshala to give a talk, similar talk of more results. So it's very exciting indeed. Wonderful. Well, Dr. Gupta, Harsh, oh, please. Yeah, please go ahead, Abhijit. Um, and I, I guess you are already aware of this. So yeah, this was uh, ISRO mission, like where ISRO led, uh, you know, but in the science team, there is also NASA being a, you know, equivalent partner to the whole mission. And some of the instruments that uh, uh, the Vikram lander and the, the rover carried are actually from the NASA side. So again, it's a victory of science and it's a collaboration of the science of the two countries. Absolutely, absolutely. Wonderful. Um, Harsh, Abhijit, thank you so much for your time. Uh, looking forward to building this collaboration between Geological Society of America and Geological Society of India. And as always, if there's anything you need um, from us, please reach out, but we'll be in touch over the coming weeks. Thank you.